Now, the latest from ITV News Meridian with Sangeeta Barbara and Fred Dynage. Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines. It was very obvious she was dead. The son of a Hampshire pensioner describes the moment he found her as a man stands trial for murder for a second time. Why are dead and starving horses being dumped in record numbers in the south? We investigate. Fuel cheaper than bottled water. How experts predict the cost of filling up the car will carry on falling. And the babies kept cold at birth to help them survive. We catch up with them as they turn six years old. Good evening. The son of murdered pensioner Georgina Edmonds described in court today the moments leading up to the moment he found his mother's body. The 77-year-old was discovered dead in the kitchen of her cottage in Brambridge in Hampshire in January 2008. She'd been stabbed and beaten to death with her own marble rolling pin. Matthew Hamlin from Bishopstoke was found not guilty at a previous trial. He's now gone on trial a second time and denies her murder. From Winchester Crown Court, Andrew Pate sent this. Matthew Hamlin enters court alongside his mother. He's accused of murdering 77-year-old Georgina Edmonds. The grandmother was found in the kitchen of her home, Fig Tree Cottage, eight years ago. She was found by her son, Harry, seen here in the hat. He told the court about that day, January the 11th, 2008. Harry Edmonds relived the moment he found his mother's body. She was lying face down in a pool of blood. He said seeing her injuries, he knew immediately she was dead. Mr Edmonds climbed through a window to get into Fig Tree Cottage as he was concerned all the lights were off and his mother wasn't answering her phone. He was joined inside by estate manager Ian Wrightson. They saw the pensioner on the floor. Harry Edmonds said, Mr Wrightson checked for a pulse. He said there was no pulse at all. It was very obvious she was dead. Obviously, this was a crime scene. They called 999 and soon after the police began investigating in and around the cottage. Mrs Edmonds had received a large number of cuts to her body and had been hit by a blunt instrument. The prosecution say that instrument was her marble rolling pin. Harry Edmonds said Ian Wrightson used two towels to cover the pensioner. Then they went outside as the paramedics and the police were inside. Matthew Hamlin listened intently as Georgina Edmonds' son gave his witness evidence. The 36-year-old from Bishopstoke was found not guilty at a previous trial. At this retrial, he denies murder. The case is expected to last six weeks. Andrew Pate, ITV News, Winchester. In other news, a man has appeared in court charged with the murder of a retired solicitor in Sussex. Donald Locke, who was 79, died from stab wounds on the A24 at Finden in July. 34-year-old Matthew Daly from Worthing appeared at Lewis Crown Court accused of murder and possessing a knife in a public place. The case has been adjourned until April. A man's died in a crash involving three cars on the A31 near Alton. It happened on the southbound carriageway near Four Marks just before 7 o'clock last night. Two other people, a man and a woman, were taken to hospital with minor injuries. The road was closed until 2 o'clock this morning. Drivers around Southampton face nine-mile tailbacks this morning due to a five-car pile-up on the M27. The crash happened near the junction for Eastleigh on the eastbound carriageway. One car ended up on the roof of another car, but no one was badly injured. A man's appeared in court, charged with murdering a woman at a barber shop in Blandford. Katrina O'Hara, who was 44, died from two stab wounds a week ago. 
49-year-old Stuart Thomas, known as George Thomas from Blandford, was remanded in custody to appear at Winchester Crown Court next week. The Debenhams department store in Worthing was closed this morning after a fire broke out. Staff evacuated the store when the blaze started in a display unit on the ground floor. No one was injured and investigation is underway. Horses are being dumped dead and dying across the south in record numbers. In Sussex, animal shelters say they're struggling to cope with horses abandoned, needing expensive veterinary treatment. So why is it happening? Charlotte Wilkins has been finding out. Frail, starving and callously dumped at a gate. This pony called Dotty was so skinny she could barely stand up. The problem's escalated. Um, every day I probably get five or six phone calls and the same amount of emails with people needing help, either people that are trying to prevent that from happening from their horses because they can't afford to keep them anymore, or people that have come across horses dumped in car parks, um, just let go on the main roads, or dead. And as a result, rescue centres like this one are bursting at the seams. Just to give you some idea of the scale of the problem, this rescue centre alone, with the help of social media, has rehomed 33 horses in just one month. We're desperately urging people that if you've got a horse, you know, if you've got an animal that's in need, you don't need for it to get that bad. You know, please, please contact us or other charities and ask for help. Dumping these horses like this is just is unforgivable, and these poor animals, um, it's just absolutely needless suffering. <laughs> The exposure of the illegal horse meat trade is one factor being blamed, and it's now cheaper than ever to buy a horse. A few years ago, owners could have demanded £400 for their animals. Today, though, some are sold for as little as a fiver. But keeping them is costly, with vets' bills, food and livery charges continuing to rise. Thankfully, Dotty has made a full recovery and the rescue centre here has started a new scheme which could prevent other horses from suffering like she has. They hope to connect horse owners with other horse lovers who don't have the time or the money to own one of their own. Charlotte Wilkins, ITV News. MPs from the South are calling on the government to ensure fair and equal treatment for transgender people. A parliamentary report makes over 30 recommendations, including tougher protection from discrimination. The committee, which includes the Basingstoke MP Maria Miller and Portsmouth South MP Flick Drummond, found there is still widespread transphobia which can undermine careers, living standards and access to medical care. There's a huge rate of suicide amongst trans people and that is very concerning and it, we've just been discussing in Parliament this morning about social media and the bullying um, and all that sort of culture and often it's directed towards people who are slightly different or who people perceive as different. Uh, they're not, they're people, they've just decided that they want to choose another life. Campaigners have lost their bid to save at historic level crossing. Network Rail claimed the wooden barriers at Plumpton near Lewis were unsafe and needed replacing. Residents said they were essential to the unique character of the village, but they were overruled by councillors. Designers have been appointed to come up with plans to build a tunnel under Stonehenge. £17.5 million is to be spent on, on that section of the A303 in Wiltshire to improve congestion. Atkins Arup will now develop options for the scheme, which it's hoped will get underway in four years' time. Work to replace 120 beach huts damaged in storms two years ago will go ahead. Planning permission has been granted for the huts, costing £1.3 million on the seafront at Milford-on-Sea. Fuel may end up being cheaper than bottled water if oil prices continue to plummet. That's according to motoring experts today. Well, oil prices have dropped 30% since the start of December and it is predicted prices will continue to fall with drivers paying just 86 pence per litre for fuel in the coming months. With more now, Rachel Hepworth. 
Well, it's good news. It's nice to see something come down in price for a change. When was the last time you saw fuel prices like these? Well, it was 2007 that diesel last dropped below 97 pence. At this filling station, they're selling what must be the cheapest in the country. But on average in the south, prices have dropped to just over a pound, thanks to a global collapse in the cost of crude oil and a price war between supermarkets. When I saw it was 99p a litre, I thought there was a mistake in the digital display. I save about £25 on a tank at the moment, which is great. Saved me a few quid, so I'm chuffed the bits. <laughs> Unanimous approval from motorists then, but it doesn't leave garages much room for profit. Some are deciding to sell at cost or even below cost in order to make a point. We have to bear in mind that at a pound a litre, 75 pence goes to the government by way of excise duty and VAT. Taxi firms and haulage companies too are feeling the benefit. Yeah, yeah tomorrow's no problem, David. Yeah, that's absolutely... This haulage business operates across the South and Europe. Um, well, I spend around about £100,000 a year and I'm saving around about £14,000 a year at the moment, so a big difference. The cost of fuel is something we all feel, whether directly at the pumps or in the price of goods in the shops. So it's not surprising passions run high when prices rise. At their peak in 2012, they reached around £1.50 a litre. Now it's at a pound, the government will lose a billion in tax revenue compared to last year. A rise in duty in the next budget seems likely. I would have thought two pence a litre up, I'd be a betting man and put ten quid on that. Motorists, meanwhile, are making the most of it. Indeed, some predict it could go below 90 pence a litre in the coming months. Rachel Hepworth, ITV News. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Coming up... Music to their ears, the hospital radio station up for a string of awards. And for more on all of our stories, why not head to our website. You can give us a call on 0808 1010 095 or get in touch via Facebook or Twitter. Well, the past few weeks, the South has braced itself for flooding, but thankfully we have escaped some of the terrible scenes played out over Christmas further north of the country this year anyway. Well, there has been some flooding in our region. These pictures are from Alfriston last week. Homes were affected, roads and driveways were underwater and fields and farmland turned into lakes because of heavy rain. Rivers remain high with flood alerts still in place along the Thames, including Henley, Pangbourne and Purley. Well, experts at Oxford University say we've had the warmest December on record and it points to climate change. So, is it time to rethink how we cope with what could become an annual problem? The issue is explored on ITV's Tonight programme this evening as Matt Price now reports. Record temperatures bringing record levels of rainfall, so-called once-in-a-generation flooding, happening time and time again. There was no sign of the rain stopping. We knew we were in problems, that the river was coming up. We knew that we were going to flood. As Britain enjoyed the mildest winter on record to date, out in the Atlantic, huge storms were racing towards us. We were waist-deep in cold dirty, sewage-laden water. We were upstairs for about four hours. I had to have cold showers because by this point the, the, the electric had gone, the heating had gone. But why are such rare weather events occurring so often? For experts, it's obvious. We've just seen the warmest December ever recorded. What we're seeing is the first signs of climate change coming through into British weather. This is if you like, the consequences of the one degree of warming we've seen due to human influence on climate over the past century. Some believe the easy way to stop homes flooding is not build them in at-risk areas. Research from Greenpeace shows 9,000 new homes are scheduled to be built in areas which might flood. It's news which has angered Mary Donner, whose house has been flooded six times. We do need an urgent review as to where we build, how we build, and we as a country have got to accept that we're going to have this weird weather, this heavy rainfall, intensive downpours, and how do we as communities, as individuals, government and environment agency and local government all work together collectively to reduce flood risk? 
In a statement, the Department for Communities and Local Government told the Tonight programme that they have in place strong safeguards to stop inappropriate development in areas at risk of flooding. In some parts, they're taking flood prevention into their own hands, a radical approach, planting trees to stem the flow of water. Obviously, the rain that hits these fells goes through these streams. And so if we can slow water down here and slow down the impact of that water on the stream, then we'll hopefully have a benefit in terms of the overall potential of the loon to hold water. For Adele, the cleanup continues after the Christmas floods, the support of her local community, the bright lights on those dark December days. Matt Price, ITV News. And you can see more on coping with floods in the future if you watch the Tonight programme here at 7.30 on ITV. Now, six years ago, two girls were among the first babies to be given a radical new treatment known as cooling. Yes, back then, Anna and Chiara were born not breathing and without a heartbeat. Their parents, unsurprisingly, were distraught and thinking the worst. But then they received therapeutic hypothermia at Southampton's Princess Anne Hospital, meaning they were kept deliberately cold to reduce brain damage. Kerry Swain has been to revisit the girls and see the remarkable results of the treatment. Concentrating over a game of chess, six-year-old Anna already sufficiently skilled to beat her older brother. Yay! So you've won. One wanted new wallpaper. Listening to her learning to read, it's incredible to think that Anna was still born, no heartbeat. She didn't breathe for 23 minutes. Her parents warned if she survived, she could be severely brain damaged. But in 2009, there was a new treatment for babies deprived of oxygen at birth. For three days, Anna was kept in a medically induced state of hypothermia a special vest filled with cooled water, reducing her body temperature by three and a half degrees. Less than two months old when I first met her, Anna was alert and responsive. At nine months, I found her crawling, her intelligence clear to see. Her development since then has been normal. She was monitored for five years, and after five years, she was then discharged as a normal child, no problem whatsoever. She's really lovely and full of humour and... Yeah. Clever. <laughs> yes, in artistic and mm. I don't know, she, she just brings a lot of love to the house. She's just full of joy. Therapeutic hypothermia is now standard practice for newborns deprived of oxygen, approved by NICE. Cooling within six hours of birth slows the metabolism, limiting inflammation and the death of brain cells. But doctors say cooling is not a miracle cure. Up to a fifth of oxygen-starved babies will die despite treatment. A third of those saved will have a disability. I am in the group. Kiara has hearing problems and a language delay, but lifeless at birth and not expected to live, her progress since cooling is astonishing. When I last saw her at seven months, she was reaching all expected milestones. Now in her second year at school, keeping up with her peers. Uh, it took them somewhere between 25 to 28 minutes to get her. Uh, to get her heart started again. She didn't breathe at all, actually. The first time she walked was amazing. The first time she talked was amazing. Immense pride at how she's turned out. I mean, she amazes us every day. Can and look at this. We can't believe that she's at school, let alone in a mainstream school and with children of her same age and, you know, of same ability. And we're really proud of how well she's doing. Kiara and Anna were among the first babies cooled at the Princess Anne Hospital in Southampton, which now treats up to 30 oxygen-deprived newborns every year. It's very nice to see the outcome of these children. At the time, the experience for both the clinicians and the family is, can, be, can be very challenging, and it's, it's lovely to see them doing so well. If Anna and Kiara had been born before cooling was introduced, they may not have survived. Every year her birthday for me is like she's born again. That's maybe it's the most beautiful day in my life. These beautiful girls saved with a mild case of hypothermia. Kerry Swain, ITV News. Afraid we can't believe it. Six no. years, we remember them. And beautiful, beautiful yeah. girls. Yeah, well, from cool babies it. to cool kids. Hmm. <laughs>
Now, tomorrow, Major Tim Peake will climb out of the International Space Station and become the first official British astronaut to walk in space. Yes, for the 43-year-old from Chichester who graduated from the University of Portsmouth, it'll be the culmination of years of training, but it doesn't end there. No, yesterday we took you behind the scenes of the European Space Agency in Cologne to show how Major Tim prepared for his mission. But just what is it like to live and work in space. Well, our own astronaut Fred has been finding out. And lift off. Lift off of Tim Cooper, Yuri Malenchenko, and Timothy Peak. It's the mission of a lifetime. Tim Peak, born in the year of the last lunar landing, now the first British astronaut to live on board the International Space Station, working for the European Space Agency. But what exactly does he do all day? I'm in the Columbus laboratory with Jules Grandsire. Why Columbus? Because it's discovery, I suppose. Exactly, that's a symbol. For us, Columbus is a symbol for discovery, for exploration. Here you have the capacity of a, a university campus. Each of those racks are responsible for different um, areas of science. The European Physiology module, this is where Tim will spend a lot of his time making experiments on his own body, will be the guinea pigs of a lot of experiments. We have the fluid science laboratory, and as you see, it's on the ceiling because Tim can just change orientation in space. That's the advantage of microgravity. And over here? That's what we call the glove box. And here, we, you know this maybe from other laboratories, this is where the astronaut can uh, make experiments in a safe uh, environment. Jules, this is all making me very tired. I've got to go and lay down. Good. Thank you. Let me show you now an example of the sleeping accommodation that Tim Peake is using even as we speak. Come inside here. It's not exactly spacious. Everything Velcroed to the wall because otherwise it would be flying everywhere. And inside this bag here, an astronaut's everyday reading, a clock, of course, very important, and a toothbrush. Ordinary, everyday, but essential things. And when it comes to bedtime, Tim climbs inside a sort of sleeping bag like this and gently floats off to sleep. So if you'll excuse me, no night. It's taken six years of training for Tim to reach this stage, yet no matter how well prepared, the rigours of space will take their toll. Without Earth's gravity, Tim's muscles will weaken, he will lose bone density and will return shorter. So he has to spend hours every day exercising on specially adapted gym equipment. Tim, tell us about the challenges that face you in the coming weeks and months, the things you have to do, the things you're looking forward to, the things you're dreading. Well, firstly, Fred, there's absolutely nothing I'm dreading. Uh, life up here is absolutely spectacular. Um, there are certainly some challenges ahead. We've got a very busy schedule, both with the science program, the visiting vehicles as well. Preparations for potential spacewalks, EVA, are ongoing. So uh, plenty of work to do over the next six months. And now, of course, we know that Tim's first spacewalk is set to take place tomorrow. So, how have the staff here at the Astronauts Training Centre prepared him for the most hostile environment known to man? I don't think it's that dangerous. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, an army of people out to make sure that we're doing everything as safely as we can. Yes. There is certainly a, a lot of danger in sitting on top of all this uh, explosive fluids yeah. um, in the environment in space, but it is very well controlled and we have safety features built in and, and rescue abilities uh, to get the, the astronauts back. The International Space Station shows the world that there is a way. There is a way of cooperation. There is a way of working together. And again, Russians, American, Europeans, Japanese, and Canadian, we all work every day on this program. So that shows a way that is possible. And life on moon eventually for us? The, Euro the International Space Station is a step board for further exploration, of course. So we're looking at the moon, we're looking at Mars, we're looking at the future. It's that spirit of collaboration between so many nations that really sets this new era of space exploration apart. An example, perhaps, and a hope for us all. And Major Tim Peake is at the very heart of it.
Fantastic. Now, a radio station which broadcast to hospital patients has been nominated for a record-breaking number of awards. Yes, Hospital Radio Basingstoke, which is based at the Basingstoke and North Hants Hospital, has been shortlisted in seven categories at the National Hospital Broadcasting Awards. Now, Bloor has been to meet the team behind the microphone. Good afternoon, you're listening to Hospital Radio Basingstoke. It's two minutes past three and you're listening to Music On Demand. And coming up in the... Hospital Radio Basingstoke has been broadcasting to patients and staff since 1972. Run by a team of 40 volunteers, it relies solely on donations. And now after Elvis Presley and Jailhouse Rock... The station has now received a record seven nominations at the National Hospital Broadcasting Awards including Station of the Year, Best Male and Best Female. It feels really, really good. It shows that the station is doing what it should be doing amongst the number of hospital broadcasters that there are around the, the country. And hopefully we'll receive the, the actual awards for these. But things haven't always gone to plan for this hospital radio station. Back in 1999, it was forced off the air after it burnt down in a fire and lost its entire music collection. But after an appeal for funds and records, Hospital Radio Basingstoke was back up and running 18 months later. In 2009, the station moved into a building of its own, opened by none other than ITV Meridian's Simon Parkin. Good morning, Hospital Radio. Can we play you some music this evening? The station now broadcasts 24 hours a day, with request shows in the evenings and at weekends. Well, I've got to listen to something, haven't I? Nothing on the telly, something It's great when you're in here, when you, the afternoons are long and there are no visitors. Just tune in, it's lovely. It can get quite boring in hospital, especially like in the evenings when family have gone, even though we do operate uh, 12 to 8 visiting time, but it just gives them something to listen to more than anything else. The radio station will find out if it's won all or any awards at a ceremony in Watford in March. Mel Bloor, ITV News, Basingstoke. Wonderful hospital radio. And we yeah. saw Simon there and he's here now, Simon. Yeah, that was me doing the opening. I, I must say, have a look at the picture. I don't look best pleased to be there, but I did enjoy it, <laughs> honestly. But uh, that's me with Sophie and Rebecca Hyde and Marilyn Price, who was the chairman. Now, don't you look handsome? Well, well yeah, ish. <laughs> anyway, moving on quick, here's a handsome sight that yeah. you might just catch it around sunset. That wow. there wow. is a murmuration of starlings that uh, Mark Tilly in Burgess Hill took this video. They've been over his house for the last few nights. Thousands yes. of them swooping around. Uh, the reason why they do it, there's several reasons. One of them is uh, safety in numbers because your predators like peregrine falcons can't get one because they're all swirling around together. The other thing is keeps them warm before they uh, go for their nighttime huddling. So oh, amazing. amazing. You might see it this time of year. Uh, in other bird pictures, though, this is another sort of Alfred Hitchcock moment that Karen Jones uh, found herself having in Angmering. Uh, that's a feeding frenzy of gulls. Speaking of which, Hannah Harris from Fairham spotted this at Stokes Bay Golf Club. That's a juvenile seagull nicking a golf ball. Look. <laughs> Who knew they had the strength? <laughs> amazing. Incredible. Our viewers are amazing. What would we do without them? And what would we do without Simon Perky Parkin? Here he is with your forecast. That's us driving on, mm -hmm. us driving off in France, Ooh. and us outside a chateau. Oh. Driving to Europe. Eurotunnel Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, here's a gorgeous view of the starlit sky above Philosopher's Tower that Martin Dolan took yesterday. But of course, there is a downside to lovely clear skies and that's that the temperatures plummet. And certainly tonight it is going to be fairly nippy in our towns and cities. We may just stay above freezing, but certainly in some rural spots, we're going to dip down to minus one, minus two. And so towards the west of the region, that's where we have a warning for perhaps a bit of snow over the higher ground. Nothing too major and some ice for first thing tomorrow morning as well. But a really risk of an odd shower cropping up at times during the night, although it should be a largely dry start to tomorrow, but with quite a bit of frost around and some very fine winter's sunshine to get us going as we head through the day. Not quite as windy as today, so it shouldn't feel quite so cold and raw. That said, temperature's still quite disappointing, peaking at a lowly five or six degrees, so certainly not a warm day either. Definitely a gloves and scarf kind of day. As for your high tide times, well, you can see in Southampton around 25 to 3 in the afternoon, 25 to 5 later on in the evening and then the weekend dry and fine but still cold. Ah, oh. Eurotunnel the shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian weather.
In this moment, we have the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. Yes, and Gita's got our late news. Make sure you join her if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you as always very much indeed for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. See you later.